weather passes us here. And for those of you out, if you're not in Springfield, I hope you're all safe too. So it's noon, we'll get started here. And I uh, just wanna welcome everybody. My name is Greg Fansler, and I serve as, as uh, Executive Director of Engagement and Alumni Relations here at the Alumni Association in the Office of Division of Advancement. Um, that's part of uh, the University Foundation. So a uh, pleasure to be here with you and good afternoon. Welcome to the seventh of our 10 part series, Conversations with the College. And, um, and we created this series uh, to give alumni and community members the opportunity to connect with and hear from our college deans and the vice president of student affairs. And um, our deans and the vice presidents um, and the vice president of student affairs are just excited to share with you all what is happening on campus today and to celebrate really some of the recent achievements that have occurred um, as part of the college, to paint a picture of what hold, what the future holds uh, for, for their respective colleges and for Missouri State. And through these conversations and this series, our senior administrators um, have illustrated the impact alumni and friends have had on the, on, on the colleges in their respective academic units as part of our Onward Upward campaign. And this impact uh, really translates into new buildings, scholarships, professorships, and much more. And we want to thank all of you who here who, uh, who joined us today, who've supported Missouri State throughout the campaign. And thank you for your engagement here today, tuning in to hear from Dean Mark Smith. Uh, so um, I'd like to uh, first, uh, before I move for further, I would like to acknowledge Angie Rowe, who's our, advanced who's our advancement strategic communications content specialist. She helped organize all of these events and promoted them. Thank you, Angie, for your help and support. And um, would like to start with uh, basically introducing our Dean, Mark Smith. Uh, Mark is, uh, comes to us uh, from, from London. He did study in Brunel University of London, where he got his bachelor's, and then he received his master's degree from Western Carolina University and his PhD uh, in Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Georgia in Athens. Um, Mark came to us uh, from uh, serving as Associate Dean of the College of Natural and Health Sciences from the University of Northern Colorado. He was a bear there and decided to be a bigger bear and came to Missouri State to be Dean in August of 2019, where he serves as uh, the Dean of the Macquarie College of Health and Human Services. Mark, um, coming up on your three-year tenure here, uh, Really looking forward to hearing from you and what um, what's taking place in Macquarie in, in the Macquarie Human Health <laughs> Sciences College. Uh, please take it away. And uh, for those of you again, uh, remember as Mark to, as Dean Smith continues to have his presentation, you may think of questions. Think and you're welcome to drop them in the Q and A, and we'll I'll come back on and facilitate those here in about twenty or thirty minutes. Thank you. Enjoy. Well, Greg, thanks for hosting and and Brent and everyone else at the foundation. And again, I will echo the sentiments of. Um, of what Greg talked about was thank you for taking your time on and what is in Springfield or a very dreary, rainy, London-ish day out there. Um, I said it for those that went on earlier, I'll apologize if something happens, but we are in the middle of a big renovation on the building. I'm in professional building, aka computer hall, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later and hopefully, fingers crossed, everything works out. So um, really simple. I'm going to just go through a couple of slides and then leave hopefully at the last half hour, 25 minutes for a little bit of quick question and answers if you have any about the college and what we're doing. Um, as I think Greg outlined, I've been here for, for three years. Well, this is my, the midway through my third year. Um, so in those, in those first three years, there's been a lot of challenges with, with the multiple events, worldwide events, including the pandemic that's impacted what we do. Yet I'm really, really proud of what the faculty has been able to do, what the staff have supported, what the university as a whole has been able to achieve in such a short time. And and that's kind of some of the some of the conversation I'll have today um, to share with you. So, as noticed, we're the McCurry College of Health and Human Services, um, uh, named just before I got here after the McCurry family in town in Springfield here. So, the, the topics of conversation I want to go through just to outline a little bit. There's there's five different main ones. The first one is we're going to look at just a little bit of the academic units and the clinics and the services we provide, because those those are just kind of a refresher for those of you who have been at Missouri State or even before it was called Missouri State, there's a lot in the college. Um, and so we're gonna go over those. Community academic partnerships have been something for the last three years that we've been really working hard on as a university. And, and I would like to share some of that. Um, as alluded to by Greg, and I've already mentioned, we've been going under several renovations and we've made some significant structural changes. 
um, during my time here. Um, so I will a little bit share about that. Big one that I think is really important that I'm that is an initiative that we've started and we're about to hopefully complete the final step of the building is student success and advisement, and then just some general initiatives that we've been doing as a college um, for you um, and for, for our students for the past at least three years, if not longer, but at least I'll talk about the last few, three years. So the first one of those is the academic units um, and clinics and services. So um, you may not know, but the McCurry College is made up of 11 different units and the 11 units are on the screen there um, in alphabetical order from left to right and then drop down in lines. Uh, so they're color coded for a different reason. So those that are in the, the biomedical science, physiology and the ready rounding color, are all units that have undergraduate and master's level programs. Um, if you look at the purple color, the School of Nursing Communication and Science, those are our programs that actually run all the way from um, an undergraduate program all the way to doctoral programs. So you would understand that's a, a very different viewpoint. And the ones in green are our professional programs or our graduate only, which have master's and doctoral programs as well. So one of the things that you'll hear about today is that we're looking to increase our doctoral programs this is the structure of the college. So within those, there are a lot of different programs, certificates, qualifications, all of those things that we have to talk about. Um, and part of, part of what this is, and one of the things that we don't talk about is amongst all of those, we have 15 different accredit agent, accreditation agencies that we answer to, to make sure that all of, the, all of our students that leave those professions go out into the community and go out into their chosen profession and a license or accredited to do so. So there's a lot of parents, if you will, that we have, including the state, our learning commission, and then those accreditation, accreditation agencies that we need to work with. So it's kind of just giving you a little bit of a snapshot of what the college is made of and, and how we're structured, at least through our department. Within those departments, um, we've got a variety of clinics and services, and I've kind of done them in a, also a color coordinated, just in case you're uh, interested. We've got MSU Cares Clinic, which is actually a partnership with Mercy. Um, that is housed on campus, that serves 150% of the poverty level, so a lot of homeless, and individuals that don't meet the Medicare, Medicaid requirement, and they can get services here, and it's a joint venture with Mercy, it's a clinic that we run. Um, we have uh, clinical faculty there, so some of our nursing and our PA faculty work there. Mercy provides the infrastructure and the other support of that, so it's truly a shared clinic in that respect. Um, and then we also have our students that can go there from our nursing and our PA program. The four in green are actually clinics that tend to work um, on campus, serve different populations of the community, but are also ones that we have our students work within. So our OTC, uh, Occupational Therapy Clinic, our PT Clinic, Speech Language Hearing Clinic, and our preschool for the children with impaired, all work with the community focus, provide services at different levels, be it pro bono to a sliding scale, um, they'll provide those services, which also interacts with our students at the undergraduate and graduate levels, primarily graduate levels were the ones I have right there. Um, and then we have services. So I don't want to discount those. So we have a learning diagnostic clinic, which works with students um, in the uh, from the uni university and the community to help them with issues where they're struggling a little bit to figure out why they struggle to learn or what better study habits. And we have a couple of grants through that. And then the RSTATS Institute is something we don't talk about, but it's a college-wide institute that provides research and statistical analysis opportunities um, for students within the college. So they can get help and faculty can get help. And, and we're working on, we have currently three, two full-time faculty and a, and a coordinator that works in that area. So I'm just kind of giving you the lie of the land with what, what the college looks like, just, just the structure of it from a, um, a purely academic perspective in this case. So, Universities, we move forward, and one of the things that the foundation has talked about, and one of the things that we're working on is workforce development, is the university is, in my belief, is only as strong as our community, and, and what we give back to it, what the community helps to us, and how we interact with each other. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some recent community partnerships and, and how that, whether uh, with alumni, whether it's with the community, whether it's, whether it's with our, 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 our individuals that are willing to support and, uh, and provide financial support to the university as well. So that's gonna be under our community and academic partnerships. So I'm gonna do that in two different ways. First off, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on what we do already. And I think people miss this. Um, as I said already, we have 15 accredited agencies, which is 15 partnerships 
we must and we have to maintain for our students to go out into the world. So our nursing students, our PA students, our PT students, our OT students, our physical education teachers, our CSG or our audiologists or speech language pathologists, our athletic trainers, and we can keep going, um, all have to make sure that our program is accredited for them to go out. And as you would imagine, that's a lot of time and a lot of commitment and there's a lot of dedication between the faculty and the staff because um, those accrediting reports and those uh, are not easy, easy things to do in, on a sliding scale of every five to 10 years. For example, we just spent two years, our most recent one, we went spent two years with our phys uh, physician assistant program, um, going through their self-study, their accreditation, their site visit, and we came back um, with glowing recommendations. So now we're accredited for the next 10 years with very little or, or any um, um, real substance on just a couple of things we had to make comments with. Um, every time we make changes in our nursing, we have to go through the State Board of Nursing to make changes, whether we increase our numbers um, or whether we change our modalities. And in that particular case, we just went through the Board of Nursing to increase our cohorts in nursing next year from our 48 per semester for the fall and spring. Um, we're moving to 56. So that was another whole report, another meeting that gives you an idea of what we have to do that's not typically seen. Um, the affiliation agreements, I think this is something that we need to thank all of you out there that's in the community. I need to thank all of you out there that's part of the university. Um, just this year alone, we're close to 400 affiliation agreements. Um, and what that means is we sign individual agreements with different places or collective agreements so that our students can go practice and go get the experience that they need and their clinicals in those sites. And we do that across all of our departments. So we have 400, that was just the year, and that doesn't include affiliation agreements that have been even longer. So you can imagine the relationships we need to have and the support we have from the community. And then some examples of that, we have the MSU Care Clinic, athletic training. We have 20 plus GAs in athletic training that they come into our program and they're housed by SPS, they're housed with Evangel, they're housed with Drury and they work for their athletic departments. Um, they work with Mercy and Health Tracks and support their schooling through that arrangement where they provide GAs for us. So it's an example that has been here and it's working really well. And then there's other things. I just put one example here of the Chamber of Commerce where we work with them to bring prospective students, um, seventh graders come to work and take a look at what our programs are, especially in that particular case, it would, would have been, it got snowed out. Unfortunately, it would have been male students in the community to come and look at the healthcare industry and, and maybe um, go into a different area. So that's just one of the things that we do. The next slide I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit about some exciting things and partnerships that have happened in the last year or two. Um, some people know most of these, but there's a couple in here, or one on here that's a bit of a surprise, I think, maybe. Um, so I've got three different things on the slide there. So the one on the left is the Borough Partnership, which has been in the news and I'm super proud of. Um, Missouri State um, and Lacroix College has partnered with Borough um, in developing a brand new Doctor of Psychology program. Um, so that's coming, coming hopefully in 2023. Um, I talked about all those parents for a reason. We've gone through the curriculum stake at the university. We've gone through the play. We've gone through the the accreditation. Uh, we've gone through sorry the state board, uh, higher education, and we're at the higher learning commission. And once we've done that, we were going to add another accredited agency because we have to go through APA, the American Psychological Association, to get their approval. And that is a brand new program that we're partnering with Borough that would see students do their didactic and their classroom experience with us, have of the, all of their placements, have about two thirds of their placements with Borrow, do their internship in different areas. We're talking about shared faculty, where faculty from and, and staff from Borrow can work with the, the school and where our faculty can work with Borrow in placements. And that's a huge partnership that comes with a 500,000 500, stipend from Borrow grant funded to help us get that program underway with staffing as well as support. So that's a, a huge thank you to Borrow and partnership there. And again, that's a partnership that we believe as a university, as a college, and as a, as a program will not only meet our, the needs of all of the industry and the needs of everything else, but bottom line, the community, we don't have enough partnerships. The top one I put there is Sculpture Walk Springfield, and that's kind of a new one. Um, Weather's, weather's up, up, uh, weather is impacting it a little bit. They're supposed to be pouring a concrete slab this week um, and we're getting a new sculpture um, right in front of the McCreary building. It's obviously a doctor there to, to go through the proposal and it's gonna be part of the Sculpture Walk Springfield, which we're really proud of working with the, the city and the community 
and being part of that process. And that's, it's called DNA Dance is the sculpture, which is the one on the left of the pictures you can see what it looks like and then where it's roughly gonna go. And it's gonna be on Cherry Street, right between all the buildings. And that's a partnership, which hopefully we can encourage the community, the, the breakdown between the community and the, and the colleges and the university to continue to work together and, and, and be seen as a partner. And the bottom two there are just two other examples. In recent terms, we've worked with Mid-American Transplant. They provided us with a grant um, to do some professional development related to grief and understand what the Mid-American Transplant does out of St. Louis. Um, and they've also most recently provided us, which will come into effect in the next, next cycle, 10 $1,000 scholarships for nursing students that would um, provide help with their cost of tuition and the cost of fees through the program. In return, they will go and take a visit to Mid-America Transplant, look at what they do, and, and talk about the importance of, of transplants. Um, it's an, a medical field or an area that's very different from what we did. And IAOM is an international company that we've partnered with, with physical therapy to provide professional development certificates for existing students or would-be students or anybody that wants to get a series of different types of qualifications. And that's a different type of partnership as an academic partnership. But as you can see with all of these, the goal is what can we do better for our students? How do we partner with the community? What can we do to be part of something and not that ivory tower college or the ivory tower university? So I'm real proud of these four. There are many others. These are the four that I've chose to put on based on time. We don't have a huge long amount of presentation, but those are four things that are, that are most recently that I'm not sure everybody knew about most of those, especially the, the sculpture walk and the sculpture because that was only approved a couple of weeks ago. And um, we're hoping to get all that set up and the sculpture should be in within the next 10 days, but again, weather permitting for that. So those are things that we've done. And, and I think all of those highlight the importance of the connectivity with our alumni, with our donors, um, but nothing more than the next series of slides. We, we can talk about that, which as I've referenced is the facilities and spaces that without, without the, the building, the facilities, the, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to recruit this type of student that wants to come to the Missouri State and stay in Springfield and be, be a bear and, and stay a bear and, and continuously want to be a bear. Uh, and we are very, very thankful for our donors, for our support, for the state, for the university's work in what we have been able to do here in the college in the last, at least in the last three years that I've been here, but, but even further back with the O'Reilly building. So maybe you don't know this, or maybe you do, but there are six primary buildings that are part of the college. Um, the McCreary Family Health Sciences Hall, the O'Reilly Clinical Health Sciences Center, and Ann Campeter Health Science Hall, only known as professional with a, a, a dedication coming in September with the completion of the renovation. Um, and those are all three on one side of campus in the same location. So it's kind of a little triad that we, we have of all of those areas. The other three that are not so well known is that, um, and, I, and I should be saying, um, McCurry Health Sciences is where our physical therapy program is. O'Reilly Clinical Health Sciences is where nurse anesthesia is, um, our occupational therapy. Um, and our PAS, our Physician Assistant Studies Program. And Camp Peter Health Sciences Hall is currently a, a CSD, our biomedical science, our public health and sports medicine primarily. They also have some in the McCreary Family Health Sciences. So it gives you an idea of where different places are and our nursing offices are in that building, but they do many of their studies in the other two buildings. Pummel Hall across campus, right over by, um, Parenton over there is actually where we house our social work program. Hill Hall is where our psychology program. And yes, I was a little bit biased with the McDonald Arena. I actually teach a class on Mondays and Wednesdays there at eight o'clock in the morning. So that is my classroom. So I put the actual arena, but obviously that's where kinesiology is housed. So this is important um, because as we look at some of the things that we've changed and things that we're doing, um, donations and support from the foundation has helped us make small renovations in many of those. To, to large renovations in some of those. Um, I'll sit the small ones, for example, McDonald Arena right now, we're in the process of changing the old locker rooms into a student space and a new weight room. Hummel Hall, we're in the process of changing an antiquated computer lab that we no longer use because we look at mobile centers for testing. Um, and we've raised some revenue there to change it into a more of a collaborative classroom. Um, Hill Hall went under the renovation before I was here. Um, O'Reilly was obviously built state-of-the-art several years ago. However, um, 
we are in the process of updating our nursing sim lab in there, which is a cost of $140,000 to replace just the software and just the ability to, to video and, and provide students with the state of the art experience, which obviously is, is, a, is a cost. Macquarie Family Health Sciences, I'm gonna talk a little bit about next. So what's happened to that building? And that is the new picture of the new addition. Um, and the new addition was approved and completed last year. Um, it was renovation details. It was part of a grant with matching funds um, with a total cost of about $6.25 million. Um, and it resulted in a 14,000 square foot addition, a new 240 seat cleared classroom, 75 classroom, um, lobby space, and then obviously the custodial mechanical rooms with all the buildings that we did it. Um, and the picture I have there is Fred McCreary, who was there for the dedication with the governor of the governor of Missouri. Um, in the new facility that we opened up during COVID. Um, so now it's been in full existence, but that was a partnership with lots of people. So obviously it was the university, the state through a grant, and then obviously um, private gifts and funds um, in this particular case from some, most of that was from the McCreary family that's created in the new addition. And what does that new addition look like? Well, I've got a couple of pictures for you here. Um, so the new addition looks like this. So, um, as you can see in the top left-hand screen is new student spaces and booths. The, obviously the stairwell is that light white blue. The right top corner is the new 75 seater classroom with Zoom capacity and, and all of the things that we can do now to take instruction either in the classroom and also to provide it to those that are not able to be there under different circumstances. The bottom left-hand screen, as you can see, is the large 250 seater um, amphitheater, uh, the arena there. And that is where the dedication was, and that is all Zoom equipped, as you can see with, with state-of-the-art ability. Um, and then the bottom right hand corner just gives you an idea of the lobby where we've hosted certain events. And there's a couple of other pictures on there, which has also got some student spaces. So what that's that's what we've been able to do in the last two, three years. Um, again, thanks to the to, to donations and grants and just working together with everybody in the community. Um, the next one is the one that I'm living through at the moment. So I've not got, I didn't put any of the newer pictures, but it's Ann Campita Health Sciences Hall, and Ann is the picture in the middle there. It was at the dedication a little over two years ago now. Um, and how we got to this one is a state appropriations and matching funds. Um, and the cost of this renovation is about $10.5 million. Um, and there's a couple of things that we can talk about here. It's gonna help us create a new student success and advisement center, updated waiting room for the clinic we talked about, student lounge and study areas, which I will show you some mock-up pictures in a little bit. Um, we were able to, with all the, the mechanicals that had to come in, which is the bottom one, and all of the, uh, the central air conditioning and the, all of the bathrooms and all of the other updates, um, we ended up remodeling the dean's office. So it's a brand new suite, including a MCHS staff lounge that will be open in the summer. So staff in this area of campus, not as like you can go to the PSU. It gives them an opportunity to take lunch or to have a space for themselves. And that will be part of the dean's office suite. Um, and then obviously all the mechanicals, which is a lot of the, the general overview. Um, right now, for example, we have no heat, we have no air conditioning because they're in the process for the next six weeks of removing all of that and putting a brand new air conditioning and heating system into the building, as well as revamping all of the bathrooms and updating them all. Um, if you'd been a professional prior to this, um, when I first got here, it, I said it looked like a 70s swimming pool. It does not anymore. And I'm not going to share updated pictures because we're still in the middle of it. But I can show you what some of the renderings look like. So I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. The first one of those is an initiative that Student Success, um, which has been a big part of the college. Um, and it's a Student Success and Advisement. Um, basically what we've done in the last two years is modified our advising model for undergraduate students. So we're creating a Student, a student, advisement, a student Success and Advisement Center. Um, and then the idea is to transition to, students that come in as first-time students or transfer students, they'll come into the center, get everything that they need in one location, which we're gonna show you in a little bit. And then as a central point, they'll transfer into the units and transfer to faculty. Um, and that's trying to support the student that's coming to, to MSU. As we know, about 40% are first generation at that age. And so providing services in one location um, is imp imperative, having not pass around office to offices or building to building or space to space. So we. One of the renovations I'm gonna show you in a minute is gonna allow us to do that. Um, as I said, it's intro, intro, incoming students, which we talk about in first time new in college and transfer students primarily and at the undergraduate level, and then transfer to the program at the 
program determine transition. So that could be an introduction class or a certain point or a certain number of credit hours. And that's kind of a mock-up of the building. Um, you'll see the new facade coming on. It's not there yet. The front column is actually in gray. And this was one of the initial diagrams or the additional um, drawings that were provided when we started the renovation about two, three years ago. So Student Success and Advisement Center, there's the team on the right-hand side. Um, we've actually increased the number of advisors. So we've actually increased the number of advisors to one additional full-time assistant director position that we've been able to generate some revenue from student, student fee with, with monies from, uh, from a college-wide student fee supported by student faculty and staff. And so that's the team there in front of the bear over the PSU. Um, I put the information currently there in the main professional building and then in the Hill and McDonald. And what you'll see in a minute is where they're gonna be. And then just a little bit of their focus is the pre-admit undergrad and first and second year students primarily up to 60 hours. And their motto is at the bottom. So I wanted to give a shout out to the group and it's been a great team that have had to build it a little bit and they're all over the place right now, but hopefully with the new, with the building as it opens up in, this, in July, we'll see that. So I wanted to share that. So what is it gonna look like? So these are two sketches of what you would see when you walk into the first floor of professional. Um, and I'm doing sketches because that, the wood slats, are this, they're actually just starting to put them in today. So I've actually got to see them for the first time. They're putting them on the ceiling today in those locations. And then obviously there's a, a whole brand new design with new floor. And the advisement center on the right there is gonna be student success and advisement center is literally, as you walk through the, the, the doors, it's gonna be there on the right-hand side. It'll be the first thing you see, the first thing you come into outside of the, the entryway and the, and, the, and the doorway. As you walk down the first floor, that's what the second picture on the right looks like, is the speech language and hearing clinic on the right-hand side is the new waiting room. And on the left-hand side, um, those are three new study spaces that I'll talk about in a minute that students will be able to use as, as part of the renovation. Um, they'll have study spaces, private spaces, um, and a lounge on the other side of that location. So what does that look like? So I'm gonna, I gave you those pictures because as you can see, it's a very industrial look, a little bit more bare concrete from the building and the wood slats. I'm gonna show you diagrams of what the space is gonna look like. Um, the ceilings are gonna be different. They're gonna be actually the lighted traditional ceiling, but you should see what the spaces look like, give or take with the fabric and the spaces we have. So Student Advisement Center, for example, um, it's gonna look like this. So what you see on the right-hand side is in the, in the waiting area. In, uh, sorry, the left-hand side is the waiting area inside the center. The left-hand side is gonna be student spaces outside where that brown slats is gonna be. That's where the advisement, that right, that top ceiling is gonna look like. Um, in the bottom is the conference room in the backside. So what you will see, it's a brand new space for students to come into, feel welcome. We can meet parents, we can meet everybody. And this was all a major thank you to obviously Ann Campeter who helped with, with the donation, for, with the matching from the state and matching funds from the university to create this student space. In addition to that, if you've been in professional, there wasn't a lot of student spaces at all. There's not a lot of places to visit or see. So donations and support from alumni, as well as everyone else, has helped us do some other things. So at the end of the corridor, again, the ceilings are all wrong in at least one of these pictures, the top picture. On the right-hand side is gonna be, on the top picture, there's gonna be some computer terminals for students to use there new couches and lounge spaces and the color coordination. One of the bottom left-hand picture is example of one of those student spaces. Um, the furniture at least is gonna be a little bit different. And then the new waiting room furniture with the blue is right there. And I've, I've stuck with the blue in a sense because the first floor um, of McCreary is going to be in that blue theme. So it's all a little different, but it's gonna be the blue theme. Um, the next slide I'm gonna show you here is as we transition, the, left, the top picture on the left is actually the new student lounge which is gonna be available starting in the fall. Um, and the other two pictures, the green picture is the second floor, a little nook area that will be green on the second floor. The top right-hand picture is that burnt orange is actually gonna be on the third floor and that's gonna be the color coordinating of the wayfinding for that. And these are all gonna be student spaces that were kind of there before, um, at least the green and the burnt orange, but they weren't, weren't very strong and weren't deliberately for students. It was like, oh, we can kind of hang out here. So we're trying to create some student spaces to maximize success for them. And that, that was part of the donor's wish and also the need for the university to provide better services to our students. The fourth floor has got a little bit of a different change to it. That's gonna be in the traditional MSU color right there. Um, and what you see there on the fourth floor is a different type of color scheme. And on the fourth floor, those booths and nooks and spaces are gonna be available. Um, and they're actually gonna come there. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see a brand new student space conference room, which will house about 12 students and they can use that for their own study and spaces. These are all things that without 
without the support um, of donors and the university and, and foundation and all of the things that working together and community partners would not be possible for the students to get the, the experience that they need. Um, one thing I don't have on here, because I don't have an actual picture of it, and it's something that I think Chelsea asked, is on the fourth floor, there's going to be a brand new, uh, I don't know if it's that one, but there's going to be a brand new large computer, a la large classroom that's changing the old banquet room up there into a brand new classroom space. Um, so that'll be an 80-seater, um, full, um, fully integrated, different model. So for um, about 84 students that will be in that space, I don't have that at this point because we're in the process of getting the furniture and the, and the drawings all, all configured and done. So that's not on this picture, but that's a that will also be coming to the building, which is going to be a little bit stronger space to go. Um, the last thing, and I think I'm right on, yep, out of my 30 minutes, which is what I said I would try and do, and then at least questions or conversations. Um, we got a few initiatives that I'm proud of that I think alumni and donors are, need to be aware of and things that we do. The first of those, and this is Ashley Payne, um, it's actually a picture of her, and it was a newspaper article. She's uh, assistant professor in psychology that has been the, been the chair of our diversity, equity, and inclusion, or co-chair of our diversity, equity, and inclusion faculty council. Um, and we've got actually two committees for that. We have a student one, which I think we're the only one of the only ones on campus that has it related to a college and a faculty and staff related one, which are very active in looking at ways we can talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging on campus. Um, things that we've done in the past two years, even through COVID, we've had a robust speaker series. We've had at least six to eight speakers on campus in the college sponsored to looking at how diversity, equity, inclusion in healthcare um, as well as other areas in mental health as well. Diversity Showcase, where we had faculty and staff talk about what they were doing related to diversity, equity, inclusion. We had a student town hall, much like this, um, last spring, where we had the unit leaders and myself meet with students to talk about concerns that they have. Uh, we did a brunch with the dean last, about two weeks ago now, to do the same thing. And we also did a celebration luncheon to talk about the things that we are doing, to talk, not just talk about it, but actually to do something with it. And Ashley has been instrumental in that, and I wanted to give her um, props to that. So if you see her, she's also working with Central High School. She's working with um, Black women there and trying to figure out how they can navigate or come to you, come to places like Missouri State. So um, she's done a lot in her very short time of being at Missouri State related to this topic. Another one that we've done is something that we started a couple of years ago is the MSSIP project, which is coming out of student funds. And it's for innovation, um, and it's related to re retention and recruitment. It's about 240000 a year that goes to faculty, staff, and students sponsored by faculty or staff projects that can better the college and the university. Um, and we're always, people want to do different things. We want new projects. We've got new ideas. We've got new partnerships, but we can't always find um, the resources and the time to support it. So this is one of the ways we can do it. Other ways we can do it is obviously through grants and through and through individual endowments and, and um, releases and all of those things that is part of what we do with the foundation. And this is one of the things that we also do. And some examples, we provided software for students to learn sign language that can do it online, which if you're thinking about that, that's a challenge. Um, we've, got, we've had a mental awareness program for students in the college um, over the last two years. And we've had the Student Advisement Center, Student Success and Advisement Center had a raw program, recovery opportunities for academic resilience, and the concept of that is students that have been struggling in their first year as a freshman um, on that bubble with suspension and probation, uh, probation um, they can go through that program and get additional supports and additional things to see if we can help them. And these are all things that we're trying to do as a way of supporting the university, the community, and our students. So last couple of slides here, and I think I'm right there. The last slide here is a big thank you to anybody on the screen or anybody that's ever considering providing donation or support to the university. Um, as we all know, um, inflation has gone up, the cost of living has gone up, college has to follow that, and in fact that we will, need, we will get paid and we live in that same world, um, and student cost is increasingly passed on to them as we, we balance the state and the, the cost per student in the university. So this is a very small glimpse at some of the things that we got last year. So um, we were very fortunate as a college that through donations and these are foundation scholarships that 62 students um, received up to, uh, received a total of $247,000 in scholarships, thanks to the foundation, thanks to the alumni, thanks to donations, the average about $4,000 a scholarship, $4,000 a scholarship, clearly some are more and some are less. 
we've got more to come. We just signed an agreement, as I mentioned, with um, Mid America Transplant, and they're providing ten one thousand dollars scholarships for nursing students next year. Um, and we're working on others, but without those donations, who knows? Maybe a student over the time frame hasn't hasn't been able to complete their degree or have to drop out to work because we can't afford it or parents can't afford it. And uh, it's amazing to see how we've gone from 156 to 247 in the last two years when we were also in the middle of a pandemic. And that's a major thank you to anybody and everyone on the screen or anywhere out there that are bearers that see this at some point uh, that help support students through their gifts. It does make a difference. It is making a difference. And I'm sure those 62 students, and I just remember that this is just the college scholarships. This does not include university-wide scholarships are, are better off and are able to continue their education. So um, that's a that's an amazing an amazing opportunity right there, and a, a big thank you for what this is about. Um, and then the last one is really quite simple. I had to have a bit of fun. Um, been binging Ted Lasso forever, and I think this is a big shout out to a lot of people, and I use it as a reference occasionally. Um, there are two buttons I never like to hit, all right, and that's the panic and the snooze button, and I don't think we've done either. Um, Throughout the pandemic, throughout the last two and a half years since I've been here, the faculty, the staff, the foundation, the alumni, the university hasn't hit either of them. There were times, and I'm sure we wanted to hit the panic button, but we did not. And we definitely haven't snoozed. And I hope through the, the last half hour presentation, you've seen that we've continued to grow. We've con continued to try and provide the opportunities for students and faculty alike as best we can to, to learn. Um, and I, I think this just captures it all in a slightly different way from the, the Ted Lasso show. Um, so I think it's an important concept that we've, we've worked on and we've done. So with that, I try to keep it right at 30 minutes. I'm about at it. So it leaves us with about 20, 23 left. Um, my email's there. If you have any questions about any of it you would like, let me know. Um, there's a couple of questions popping up at some times. Yep. I can see. And if you want to look at those, Greg, I'm going to, I'll catch up with them. But if you want to paraphrase before I get there, that'd be great. Absolutely. Well, Dean Smith, thank you for your time and what an informative, informative presentation. We really appreciate and thank you for your kind words. And also, you know, Ted Lasso, be a goldfish, right? Love a goldfish as well. That's um, what a great show that was. I think um, the other one is be curious. And I think be, that's one thing that we have to do is be curious, not judgmental. And I think that's an important one. Amen to that. Um, I'll just ask a question. Do you have a couple coming in? Please send them send them along. We will get to each and every one of them. Yeah. Um, my question to you, uh, Dean Smith, is um, at, you mentioned in the outset of your presentation the pandemic and the impact it's made, mm -hmm. particularly for the majority of your time here. Um, how have you seen that increase the demand of, of student enrollment in the Macquarie College? The student enrollment, we've been very fortunate um, in many ways. I think the pandemic and others has scared a lot of things, uh, people away and in demand in ours. We're, we primarily do a lot of healthcare and mental health. So it's straight up um, a, a lot. Um, our enrollment per se has about stayed the same, which is a little disturbing for the fact that healthcare industry is having a higher turnover. So the workforce demand and the needs is increasingly going up. Um, I think we're talking about 19%. Um, retention issue in the hospitals in, in Springfield alone, and it was at 12% before the pandemic, it's 19% now. And that's still lower than a Kansas City or a St. Louis, but that's high for here. Um, so the need is growing, yet we're maintaining. So there's a lot of, inter another need for workforce in healthcare. Um, what we found out as a whole, the students have done a really nice, we've, we've maintained our enrollment. Students have been able to get in placements. Our partners, Mercy, Cox, and every other one of those 400 partners have been absolutely fantastic as we've navigated ways of getting students out there. Um, I can't thank them enough because they were dealing with their own problems with the pandemic, yet they took all of our students. We graduated nursing students early in one particular case, and we have not delayed a graduation that I know of based on placements throughout the last two years, which is a feat among itself um, for, the, for the college and the university. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, the cost is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the biggest challenge. So that's where the scholarships come in really really well uh, a lot and hopefully we can continue to support our students as they go into a difficult profession um, other areas have suffered with it i must be honest kinesiology is the opposite tourism hospitality physical activity went the other way it went into a place where we didn't have gyms we didn't have facilities and we're going to have to figure out how we can better serve as a whole and we need sure. to change that okay um, you mentioned and what exciting news about the doctorate in psychology that's coming yeah. online in 2023 
Uh, last year, Missouri State conferred its 1,000th doctorate degree. Mm -hmm. How does the McCreary College contribute to the growth and future growth of these degrees? And um, are, are we outpacing, are you outpacing most colleges with PhDs? Or <laughs> Um, so it's a little bit of a question. So it's a sore subject. So I can't use the word PhD because only the state, only, yeah. only the University of Missouri can grant PhD in the state of Missouri. Something that was unbeknownst to me upon arriving here, but we are, we had a mission change. Um, and Cliff, Cliff Smart under his tutelage with Frank Einhaleg and, um, and many of the upper administration able to change the mission of the university that we now are able to do professional doctorates. We have the majority of professional doctorates in the university outside of one other college so that is one of our bread and butter areas of professional doctorates the PsyD is one um, i'm glad you asked me we're in the process uh, at the higher learning commission at this moment in time of adding a doctor of occupational therapy which we would look to start in 23 or 24 depending on the type of doctor there's two two tracks there a completion program for those that already have a master's and those that want to start at the entry level and we're in the process of about to go through a curriculum process in the fall um, to do a new doctor in health sciences. Um, and that's designed to, for people in the health industry that wants to retool to come into education or administrative or leadership roles. So I would say we are in the state doing a really good job. We're, we're, we're leading in new areas and that supported the growth in graduate education. And when you took those 1000 graduate doctoral education, uh, all but the last year, they were all from the McCreary College. There was not one other doctoral program in the university that was that wasn't in this college until recently. So a lot of those graduates have come from this. So um, it's, it's been a, a very, it's, it's one of those beacons of, of success that I've been lucky enough to be part of at the very end of it, because I wasn't here to build it all, but um, I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to work with the people that have. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll move to some of the questions that we've received. Yeah. Um, Andrea Miller asks, how do students get access to the software for learning uh, sign language? And is this yeah, so the sign language sign language software in that program at this moment in time is actually run through the sign language courses. So it used to be we have the sign language courses and it's really difficult to teach. So part of that, part of that MSSIP grant was to instead of passing the students onto the cost of using the software that was used in the course, um, we pay for it. Or, so if you were enrolled in that course, that was how you get the software and it'd be used in that classroom. At the moment, it's a pilot. That's what we're using it for. Um, We'll see how that works out and if there's other opportunities to do it. So it's actually a very delicate software to using it that way. Um, Chelsea Davis was asking a question um, earlier in your slides, um, uh, was asking, is this where the computer lab and large classroom were? And I I'm assuming that we're talking about the um, advisement center and the answer is yes. So when you first walked into the professional building, now Campeter Hall, that right-hand side was a classroom that has been described as many things and not many of those were very good things that they described them as that is now gone into the advisement center and the computer lab has gone that was there that was barely used and it's being converted into that advisement and student space correct right? I'm, I'm assuming that's where about on the time of the presentation i'm guessing that's where it was cool um D david lutz asks um dean smith academic units sometimes are famous for their silo thinking how do you expect your different units to interact with each other and for example how will you your uh, psychology D program interact with other units within the college of um, within your college, including MSU cares. That's a great question. And there's a lot there. So we'll start with the first part. And the first part is that one of the things that um, I, I, I hope we've been instilling here, and it's been a, one of the, the goals of mine is to break down some of those silos in the college and then across the university. So some examples we have been working on uh, across departments and across schools is looking at research, for example. Research is one of those areas that every program had a, a research class that they would teach only or someone else would teach. Um, and we we're in the process of going through a faculty review process where we're going to look at that. And they've got a re uh, they're about to put a proposal together of how we can do that collaboratively so that our students are learning research at the graduate level. This is with each other, not OT with OT, PT with PT, PA with PA, but together. So that's one of the examples. We're doing the same thing in our with our anatomy and physiology, where a lot of our BMS, many of our BMS anatomy and physiology work with the departments and, and provide those services together. So it's a it's a communication. The PsyD is a little challenging. The PsyD is one at the moment that my view on this would be that as we get better, we we need to continue to bring together psychology, social work, and counseling, which is in a different college. 
and, and show us how we can work together. And I think those conversations have started right now um, out of a couple of structuring, the department head for psychology is also the department head for social work. And we're already interacting with those conversations and starting to break down those barriers. That, oh, I'm, I'm a content area and I'm a content area. Instead of looking at content, looking at services and looking at what the community needs. Um, and in that particular case, mental health. The PsyD in that case is still at the early stages of how that's going to work. MSU Care, for example, is a good place already where we um, are partnering with Borrow a little bit. They're providing some mental health services as part of that. Um, social work has a dedicated person that part of their workload goes into the MSU Care Clinic for social work services. Um, we have nursing faculty that teach and working there. We have PA faculty that working there. The MSU Care is a great example of actually community partners, different academic silos and units working together for the better of the community. And I think that can only get better. And, I, and, and I, if you, I'm happy to have that conversation. It's a great question. Um, and I'd be any, any examples or things that you can help with, but um, even decisions we make in the college, it's done as a leadership team with all of the academic units when it comes to hiring, when it comes to the next jobs and budget. Um, I, I'm a big believer in being as transparent as possible um, making decisions when you can with as many of the stakeholders as possible. Sometimes the time doesn't allow you to do that. Um, but I think that's what we're trying to do. And I believe we've started that. It's, it's a constant process. We have to continue to do it nonstop, but I'm hoping that we're doing it. Um, and, the, and we've got some other things like EDHH, deaf and hard of hearing. Um, uh, I'll, I will be moving to the College of Education starting in the fall um, because it's a better location. Dietetics Nutrition that's currently in biomedical science and we've gone through a year long process of review and they're gonna be moving to the public health and sports medicine department, but they can fit together with the, some of the things that we're doing there differently than where they felt comfortable in biomedical science. So where there are barriers, we have conversations, we look at options, and if a decision on a structural side is need to be made, we've made it. And I think we've done that on two or three occasions already. Great. All right, here's uh, two more questions from one okay. uh, listener. Um, is the actual SLH clinic being renovated or just the waiting room? Great question. So at the moment, the part of the initial scope is the waiting room. So the waiting room is part of the initial building. Um, one of the things I didn't have on here is where we are funding the MSSIP project, project and where we actually got the extra um, advisor is from student fee money. So each student pays $25 in a credit hour to the college. It goes to old course fees. It gets split between the president and the college. And then we come up with a pot of money. 45% of that pot of money will go and does go to renovations, um, supporting activities within the college and the university. Um, also, there's that one-time money. You hear about this. It's like a savings account. Um, and once we get through the project, we've walked through the clinic. The clinic is the number one priority in the professional building to look at that renovation, be it, is it the surfaces? Is it the, is it the new ceilings? Is it lights? Is it structure? So that's the next plan on the, the next phase of the renovation. Um, I'll just to give context, I'm real proud of the fact that it was a $10.5 million project for professional. Going into that, we had $25 million in deferred maintenance that didn't include any of the renovations that we've just done. So the building as a whole is an old building. Um, and that, that 10 million has barely touched, scratched the surface on lots of places. Um, it's got a lot of good spots and it's done a lot of the major areas, but when it comes to other classrooms, the clinic, other areas, we do have to continue to look at the renovations and the clinic will be part of that conversation. Um, the second one was affiliation agreement with cooperating teachers for EDH. Um, I don't know about EDH specifically. Um, most of the affiliation agreements that I sign and see um, is related directly to um, our clinical placements and our student placements, which is our internships, our externships, and our practicums. I actually don't know how we do our student teachers, to be very honest, or how that works, um, whether that's in physical education, which I would have known in my previous life as a physical education teacher educator. Um, so I am I don't have a, a direct answer to that second part of that question, okay. unfortunately. Well, Mark, hang tight real quick. Uh, we're, you're off the hot seat. Um, we're going to turn it over to vice, our vice president for advancement, Brent Dunn, who will share a few words with us. All right. Thanks, Greg. So uh, Dean Smith talked about it, and that is the uh, a lot about uh, donors and how they've helped that particular college. But we're in 
a campaign called Onward Upward. We're actually 198 days left in the campaign uh, to raise $250 million for the entire uh, university for capital support. And so Dean Smith talked about probably that, that biggest gift is to uh, take the professional building that's been called the professional building for years and years and years and to transform it. And so uh, as he mentioned this fall, uh, we'll be dedicating the Ann Campeter Health Sciences Hall. Uh, and so we'd love for everybody to attend that. But besides capital support, program support, scholarship support, he mentioned that, uh, and faculty support. So here's the date that, that I'd love for you to put on your calendar. And that is October 29th. That's a Saturday. Saturday, um, that actually that whole week is homecoming week. So all kinds of fun things going on campus. Uh, certainly uh, Saturday it is a big day with the parade, uh, the football game in the afternoon against Western Illinois. Uh, this is going to be a normal, typical homecoming. Uh, but that evening on the 29th, we'll have a, a special event that you're invited to. Uh, it will be emceed by our chairman of the campaign and probably our most well-known alum in the world, uh, John Goodman. And uh, John has been part of this campaign from day one. Uh, and, and so he, he will, he, along with some others, uh, special guests, uh, some uh, nationally uh, recognized uh, uh, artist that will be part of the show, the entire uh, marching band, uh, the, the 300 member uh, grand chorus. Uh, it, it's a fun, fun uh, event that is free. And so uh, please put that down as we celebrate the Onward Upward campaign. So basically uh, we're gonna talk about and show uh, what it was like on campus when the campaign started and what it is today uh, on October 20th. So please put that down uh, on your calendars and of course homecoming and, and all the fun stuff. And we'll be having the date for the dedication of Camp Peter Hall uh, in the coming weeks and we we'll want you to attend that as well. Greg? Thank you, Brent. Uh, Rhonda actually asks, uh, snuck in a question here on us and Mark, it's a, it's a great question because that's what I was gonna end on with you, which is in essence, how can alumni get involved and stay connected uh, to the Macquarie College? And uh, the date, by the way, is October 29th for that question that just came in. Uh, but back to Rhonda's question, and you, you see how she frames it. Um, is there an alumni database of those willing to mentor our current students? You're on mute, sir. You're on mute, Mark. Many people would like to keep me on mute, but I'm not going to stay on mute now for that question. It's a great question. The answer is no, we do not have an official database as a college-wide. Different programs that have those placement issues um, do, and they have that area. Um, I know it's a big conversation with the university for workforce development related to these, these um, challenges, and there are challenges. There's no doubt. We are Some of our areas are absolutely struggling to get different types of clinical rotations and placements. Um, Things that I do, and, and I don't know um, what different people do, is um, reach out, let me know, let others know. I invite people to come to department head meetings, to unit, uh, leadership teams, as I call them, to talk about what services they can offer. I have an advisory board for the college that we meet and discuss these very things that we just started this year. Um, and that's a topic of conversation that we'll be doing in our full meeting. Um, no, I encourage anybody that has something like that to either reach out to their home unit or the unit they are alumni, or if it's something bigger than that, please, please, please reach out to myself or the associate dean, Tisha White Minnis, uh, and we will find an avenue to get those conversations started as the university and the college start to figure out that very question. I think it's an area that we've got to do better at as a whole, and I really do appreciate the question, and, and it's something that we, we have to continue to work at. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you, Dean Smith. The um, one of the one of the things I'll just do a quick plug for is um, we are, have three new positions that we're hiring for here at the Alumni Association, and one of them is focusing directly with college and constituency engagement. And Dean Smith, um, we look forward to partnering with you to provide alumni programs and engagement connected directly to your college and to the departments to bring alumni who've graduated from the Macquarie College to come back and serve or connect with each other 
and also impact students to get to the essence of Rhonda's question. So we, we look forward to uh, to hiring that position. And if any of you out there are interested in this type of work, please consider it and, and do reach out to us and let us know. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, um, Dean Smith, I was going to give you the last word, but uh, you also have another question here, Alice. At this I did not see that one. What chair? Let me see if I can find it. There we go. Um, right. Animal research, vital role, medical advances, blah, 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 blah. That's a, it, that's a tough one. That's a, there's, there's a couple of ways I would answer that is number one, if you haven't heard about it, and I think it should be, in, it's in the news, is that many of our animal research is obviously within biomedical science, as well as the College of Natural and Applied Sciences. So um, CNES, which is a different, different college for me, uh, from us, um, they just, or in the process of hopefully securing and funding about an $80 million renovation to their own building, including a whole new wing. Um, and, I'm, and part of getting faculty to be interested in and having faculty interested in doing and supporting them is going to be those facilities because animal research is extremely difficult with the Aya Cook and the, 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 the I, I want to use a better word, accreditation that needs to be done with it. Um, I think one of the challenges we have period in the college, and I would say this across the university as a whole, is to continue being everything to everyone. So the balancing out of the service, the community, the teaching, which is the student, and then the research are all central pillars of a university's mission. Uh, and all three in the last three years, if not before, has been stretched very thin with all of the challenges that have been thrown at us. So um, I don't disagree with it at all. Um, we are in, I didn't put it on here, we're in plans. We've got a space in the personal building that is getting white boxed, which is a $2 million, uh, a potential $2 million new lab for research in biomedical sciences. We're upgrading our cadaver lab with another 100,000 to include that, that facility. So those are all things that we're trying to do. Um, direct animal research is not something that I'm not familiar with, and it would be a crossover between both us and CNAS. Um, and I would love to be at that conversation. So let me know anytime. And I'm sure Tammy, Yonke, and myself, would, as amongst others, would be interested in, in anybody's thoughts on that particular question. Well, uh, Dean Smith, uh, I really appreciate your time and your presentation and for going down this journey with us. And thank you for all of you out there asking your questions and staying with us through this hour. Uh, we really appreciate you spending your time with us over this lunch hour. We have three more conversations to go. Um, one next week is with the DAR College of Agriculture. Uh, that will be April 19th at noon. And then two more the following week, which will be April 27th for the Graduate College. And then April 28th, with the student with the vice president of student affairs and so i encourage you to register for those and hopefully um, um we hope to see you in those next couple weeks and uh, i hope your april continues to be a good one and we get past some of the severe weather and the spring blooms come out um, again um, thank you to everybody uh, dean smith thank you for your time um, for everybody out there go bears